right, so um, at this point I want to talk a little bit about the HR diagram. You may or may not have done a lab on this, a lab or two, where I had you plot a bunch of stars and you noticed that it uh, made a certain shape or shapes on the graph. But in the last video, I had this up and I was talking about uh, these numbers here. And there's another example over here, going from four, five, six, seven, where I was talking about a star as it basically collapsed down from a big nebula into a protostar and then finally to the main sequence. And I was saying that, you know, that followed these numbers basically until you hit the main sequence. But just what is this graph? Well, it is the HR diagram, Hertzsprung Russell. Uh, if I remember right, they either worked on this together or came up with it independently. Um, you could Google that to figure out for sure if you're interested. Um, but it's a very interesting graph and at its uh, most fundamental level, very basically, it's just a brightness versus temperature. So on this axis you got brightness. Another word for brightness is luminosity. And on the x-axis you've got temperature. And that's not the temperature of the star. Well, you can't actually say what's the temperature of the star because you have to s the, the temperature varies depending on where inside the star or near the star you're looking at. So <coughs> we picked surface temperature. And another thing to notice is this is in solar units. Often these are in solar units. Um, there are other units that can be used, but uh, since our sun is the most visible star and uh, the closest star to us and the most easily studied, we can use our star as kind of a sort of a comparison tool or a baseline for other stars. So however bright our star is in other units, let's just call it one in solar units. So if a star is equally bright as our sun, um, then it's going to be one solar unit. The star here, if you go straight across, any star on here will be a hundred times brighter than our sun. And then you'll notice the stage four that I talked about earlier is more than a hundred. This is not a linear curve, by the way. From here to here is a difference of a hundred solar luminosities. From here to here is a difference of uh, 10,000 minus 100. This is a logarithmic scale. Um, and it's plotted that way for a reason. If this was, were to be linear, there's no way you could fit all this information on such a small plot from 1 to 1,000, or from 1 to 10,000. You know, you need a really tall y axis to fit all those in. So if you squish them down logarithmically, you can not only go from 1 to 10,000, but you can also fit on they're really small numbers, really dim stars, 0 0.0001 times as bright as our sun, which is pretty dim. Um, similar, similarly, uh, with the temperature, it's also logarithmic. There's a difference of 3,000 here, 6,000 minus 3,000 is 3,000, and a difference of 20,000 here, so you can see it's logarithmic as well. So, um, first off, Let's notice where our sun is on here. Our sun is one solar luminosity. So it's right in line with that. And its surface temperature is about 6,000, a little bit less. Um, so it's right about there. Now, a 3,000 degree temperature star that's not very bright might be about here. A 3,000 degree temperature star that's as bright as our sun would be about here. A 3,000 degree temperature star that's 10,000 times as bright as our sun will be here. Stars do inhabit these other areas, but um, they represent different parts of a stellar life cycle. Um, one other thing you can see from this graph are these dashed lines. They tell you how big a star is. So a star on this dashed line, dashed line is as big as our sun. It has what we, what we call one solar radii. Um, the radius of that star is the same as our sun's. Anything on here, on this line, is 10 solar radii. Notice, if I put a star here and a star here, 
actually star here first off notice that this star is on the main sequence this star is not both these stars are 10 solar radii but this star is cool it's only about a little more than 3000 degrees Kelvin and it's only maybe like 10 or 20 times brighter than this, our sun and again remember this is a logarithmic scale so you know 50 is actually not here halfway um, so we got a cool star and a not very bright star assuming our sun's not very bright whereas this star which is on the main sequence also the same radius as our sun I'm sorry also the same radius as this star 10 solar radii is very hot it's like maybe 20-ish 20 25,000 degrees Kelvin and it's super bright about 10,000 times brighter than our, our sun so something's going on here that allows these two stars to have the same radii but vastly different brightnesses and temperatures Kelvin by the way you might not have heard that temperature before you probably heard of Celsius and Fahrenheit uh, Kelvin is a nice temperature because zero Kelvin is considered absolute zero basically the lowest possible temperature uh, so it's a nice scale 6000 Kel Kelvin is not the same as 6000 Celsius although they're sort of close they're only off by uh, 200, uh, 273 I think uh, Google it I don't memorize things like that unless I need to. Uh, so a, a difference of a few hundred degrees when you're 6,000 degrees is not super, super noticeable. But anyway, just to, just to note. And what else can you tell on here? Well, we got these Obaf Um These are spectral class. They could kind of tell you the first the color of the star. These are sort of reddish stars, sort of orangish stars, yellowish stars like our sun whitish stars and bluish stars uh, so we fit stars in this, this spectral class based primarily as you can see since it's on the x-axis primarily on temperature hot stars are blue really hot stars are blue quite hot stars are whitish um, warm mediumish stars like our sun are yellowish and cool stars are reddish so uh, you can tell a lot about stars from this very concise graph. Um, another interesting thing, which I kind of wish it didn't happen. I don't know. I grew up, you know, with the x-axis increasing that way, and it wouldn't really make the graph any different. It would just be reversed if we were to have increasing temperature. But you know, that's the way it's been done. So it's kind of like why do you put your last name first and your first name la last name last and your first name first it's just the way it's been done so we plot decreasing temperature on the x-axis and increasing brightness on the y-axis now um, th this should look a little bit similar to the lab if you've done it already um, where you plotted stars especially this one where um, on one lab I had you plot 25 of the brightest stars which would actually be more like this and 25 of the dimmest uh, sorry closest stars which would look more like this and this is a nice plot of a cluster of stars which we also did so um, the first off the most prominent feature which you can really see clearly on this one is what's called the main sequence and as we've learned or uh, are learning the main sequence is where stars spend the majority of their lifetime. It's kind of like, um, I guess you could say when you graduate from high school, maybe. So you become a quote-unquote adult, all the way to the point of maybe where you start to retire. That's kind of like where the, you know, the main sequence of an, a typical human life, I guess you could say. So when you plot, for example, the, uh, the cl stars closest to us, you notice that most of them fall in the main sequence. You got a few stragglers here, but they are dim for the most part. Although we got a few bright ones here, and dim meaning like sorry, I should say dim here. Bright 
is up here, and cool, mostly cool, is the x-axis, and here we got a few hot stars. Notice when I go hot, I'm, go I'm going like vertically because temperature is on the x-axis, and when I say dim, I go horizontally with my mouse because it's on the y-axis here. So um, these are red dwarfs. Now the thing about close stars is we can only see them. Uh, usually stars like these are too dim to see unless they're close. If you have a very dim light, like a little tiny flashlight, LED flashlight, and you walk like a mile away, you're not going to be able to see that light. But if you have a big spotlight like you'd use in a lighthouse, that's a mile away, you can see that, right? Same idea here. The only reason why we can see these stars is because they're close. Um, not to say that there aren't bright stars close, but most of the stars close to us are dim. And this actually says something about at least our local neighborhood in the galaxy, that most of the stars close to us are dim. You might make an assumption that most of the stars in the universe are small, small, on this line, small, cool, and dim medium size like our sun still pretty cool and still sort of dim right so you might make that assumption based on our local galaxy but are the stars in our local neighborhood uh, are they a good representation of all stars well, maybe maybe not then if you plot uh, the bright stars in the sky you find that they're all up here and that they're not necessarily close to us because they're so bright we can actually see them even though they're really far away and oh I forgot to mention something on the dim stars you see some stars dim stars excuse me in this area and these are what we call white dwarfs these are part of the death cycle of a star you could say um, as a star dies it'll enter some some stars will enter a, a white dwarf phase um, they're hot as you can see hot hot and dim hot and not bright so in this corner we have hot and not bright and in this corner we have cool and freaking bright all right now let's go to the bright stars so if you plot the bright stars you notice they f they make up two main areas the top part of the main sequence whereas these made up the bottom part of the main sequence and these stars over here which as you can see are big, hundreds, hundred times bigger than our sun, ten times bigger than our sun. The bright, hundred times brighter, ten thousand times brighter, and they're cool. All right, see that? We call these red giants. Um, but as we learned, some of these might not be giants. Some of these might be in the protostar phase, part four of the life cycle. But most likely, they're red giants. Um, and we got really hot, really, let me get back my pen here, really hot, bright, and bluish blue giants on the main sequence. Uh, put them together, you basically take, say, like a cluster of stars, which, which could include basically stars of all types, and uh, plot them on uh, HR diagram and you get the dim tiny red dwarfs you get stars like ours that are called yellow dwarfs you get blue giants and then kind of the white middle stars oh, there's a little tiny white dwarf and a bunch of red giants or maybe some protostars stuck in there and this stars move around as we've talked about stars move around on this plot, depending on their where they are in their life cycle, S they'll start off um, here as protostars, move towards the main sequence as they get smaller. They start, you know, they start big as a cloud. They shrink down, get smaller, as you can see from these lines. They get a little bit warmer, not too much, um, but they get less bright because they're not so big. And then here you got a, a bump up where it's getting brighter, warmer, and then it gets a little bit less bright, but still getting warmer and as it falls into the main sequence. This is a star like our sun. This is the path 
the star like our sun would take. All right, now that we're more familiar with the HR diagram, we're going to talk about what happens after stage seven, the main sequence, in the next video. Ta-ta.